Good evening to everybody and welcome to one more section of Abra Linha ao Vivo. My name is Marco Barone, Marco Barone from Federal University of Pernambuco, Recife. And I work with international change mostly and in contact situation and not only. Um, I would like to recall to the audience that the project Abralinha ao Vivo, Linguists Online, is held under the virtual auspices of the Abralin, Associação Brasileira de Linguística, in cooperation with partners like uh, Le Comité Internacional Permanent de Linguistes, La Asociación de Lingüística y Filología de América Latina, la Sociedad Argentina de Estudios Lingüísticos, la Sociedad Española de Lingüística, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Societas Lingüística Europea, the Australian Linguistics Society, la Asociación Internacional de Lingüística Piqué, and finally, the British Association for Applied Linguistics. So we would like to thank our partners. And tonight, <clears throat> or today, according to where you are, you're going to hear from Professor John Hamilton McWhorter. Professor McWhorter is Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. And among his main fields of interest in linguistics are language variation and change, especially in contact situations. And in particular, he studies the development of pigeons, creoles, koines, vehicular languages, um, non-standard dialects, as well as L2 acquisition. And tonight, his talk is entitled, What Adults Do to Language and How They Create New Ones. So I would like to thank you very much, Professor McWhorter, for accepting our invitation. It is an honor for us. And from now, Professor John, you may feel free to start your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Folks, I want to share something with you today, and that is something that's going on in my field, linguistics, that worries me. So I want to show you basically some of my toys, some of the things that I find interesting, and I also want to introduce you to an interesting controversy, because this controversy, I think, might be teaching a lot of you that adults and what they do to languages isn't as important and isn't as interesting as it is. I wanna share with you something that's really neat that I feel like a lot of well-intentioned people are trying to turn your heads away from for understandable reasons, but I think that the other side needs to be heard. I wanna talk about Creole languages. And what do I mean by that? Well, first I'm gonna, gonna show you my PowerPoint and I am assuming that this screen is shared and I'm going to check. Marco, is the screen shared? Are they seeing? Are they seeing my um my PowerPoint? Not yet, John. Not yet. Okay. I they, I, I guess I should hit share screen, and I just did. And so now here we are. All so, right. What I want to share with you is um this business, this controversy, and I'm referring to a particular question, and that question is, it's central in. Creole studies in the 21st century. Are Creole languages simply what happens when languages mix together? Now, before I continue, I wanna make this fuller on the screen. And to be honest, I don't remember how to do that. And so if I can't figure it out within a few seconds, we're just gonna leave it like this. I usually have an undergraduate who waves a magic wand and fixes this. Um, but that undergraduate is not here because we're all living in quarantine. And so I'm not gonna have a full screen. Oh, well, life is tough. So central question, 
are Creole languages. And these are languages like Jamaican Patois, and Haitian Creole, and Papi and Mentu, and several dozen interesting languages around the world. Are they just what happens when languages mix together? Is that all that's going on? And in Creole studies today, you have two groups on this particular question. One group could be called the Creole exceptionalists. And the Creole exceptionalists, of which I am one, think that Creole languages are a kind of language and that that's what makes them interesting. Then there's a group that you could call the uniformitarians. And what their argument is, is that Creole languages are actually a kind of language, that they've just developed like languages all over the world have, and that it's been a mistake to think of, for example, Haitian Creole as something other than essentially just another romance language. The idea is that nothing special, nothing unusual went into the genesis of languages like Gullah Creole in the United States or the Creole Portugueses of the Gulf of Guinea. The idea is that language is language everywhere you go. So there are certain people who are leading uniformitarians. They include people who've spoken to Oberlin already, such as Sally Coco Mufwene, Michelle Legraff, also Inach Abo and Umberto Ansaldo. And what you need to know is that their argument is that Creoles form in the same way as Czech or Navajo or Estonian. To them, the idea of calling certain languages contact languages doesn't make sense because all languages have formed under contact. Okay, so here's a schematic. Their idea is that what I'm showing you here is not correct because what I'm showing is there's this language that's black and there's this language that's gray and it has a certain you know, number of components, both of these languages. And then they give birth to a new language and that new language has fewer squares. It's a language just like any other. It does all the things that a language needs to do, but it isn't as needlessly complex as older languages are. And for any language that you speak, you can think of things in it that you don't necessarily need that are just there. But some languages are more needlessly complex than others, as I think all of you will understand. And if you have a language that forms under certain conditions, such as what usually happened under plantation slavery. The Creole exceptionalist argument is that what you have is language starting again. And so that's what's in the middle here. Now, what's important to realize is that when I say that a language can be less complex, I don't mean lesser. It isn't that a Creole language has too little of anything. It's that older languages have too much of everything. And I've actually argued this in a book about Warfianism that I wrote called The Language Hoax. That little picture is a picture of, of the book. And so structural differentials between languages, and that includes complexity differentials, have nothing to do with cognitive sophistication. So I'm not saying anything like that about Creoles. But nevertheless, I am saying that. I'm saying that two languages or maybe three or maybe more will come together and they'll create a new language that compared to them is like that one in the middle. The uniformitarian idea is different. The uniformitarian idea is that when languages come together, the result is what's in the middle here, which is something that's one part black and one part gray. And there's no issue of anything having been lost. Nothing has become less complex. You just have a mixture. It's just a hybrid. So that's the scheme. Now, the words are not usually wielded in a way that would put that schema into your head. But we can move now to, for example, something that Sali Coco Mufwene has said is that the extent of morphological complexity in terms of range of distinctions retained by a quote unquote contact language, and note that he puts contact language in quotes, largely reflects the morphological structures of the target language and the particular languages that it came in contact with. In other words, a language might not have a whole lot of, say, inflectional morphology, but that's because the languages that created it didn't have a lot of inflectional morphology. It isn't that two languages with a lot of inflectional morphology might come together and create a language that has very little. Or, Sally Coco Mofwene has said, second language acquisition research is largely irrelevant to Creole Genesis theory. So that's what the uniformitarian is saying. When someone says that Creoles don't come from pigeons, what they mean is that second language acquisition is not even part of how Creole languages come to be. 
Or Enoch Avo, uh, who is a syntactician, has said, the claim that Creoles are simplified versions of their sources is a fallacy, just as it would be to claim in biology that hybrids are genetically simplified children of their parents. So this is the beef between uniformitarians who have that kind of claim and a Creole exceptionalist who thinks that Creoles are something different, that more went on than just one animal mating with another, as, as Abbo puts it. And you know, Abbo's written a book, and it's a big book. But the fact is, the idea that Creoles are just mixtures of languages is a radical proposition. Isn't it fun when radical propositions are correct? I mean, it's fun. You know, something that you didn't expect turns out to be the way it actually was. That's fun science. Nevertheless, it's not obvious that Creoles are just mixtures. It's a radical proposition. And the question is, does it hold up? So what we want to do is a test. What I want to show you today in particular is this test, because when you hear really smart people say that it's been disproven that Creoles come from pigeons, you have to remember that there are other people who think otherwise and might disagree. Palenquero is a Creole language of Colombia. It's spoken in El Palenque de San Basilio, and Armin Schwegler and various other scholars could tell you more about it than me. But what we need to know is that it's spoken in Colombia, and it's a Creole language with Spanish as its basis. Now, Palenquero is useful because essentially it is created by people who spoke just two languages. You don't have the mess of dealing with people speaking 12 or 13 over many decades. It was really just two, Spanish and Kikongo. Spanish is Spanish, Kikongo is a Niger-Congo language. So according to the uniformitarian idea where languages just come together and create Creoles and Creoles are just mixtures of languages in the same way that English has got an awful lot of French in it. If that's the case, then we would think that when Spanish and Kikongo come together, you would have a certain kind of language. Palenquero, if it's a hybrid of these two, should be a certain kind of language. What do I mean? Well, here's Kikongo. Here is a random sentence. These great white stones are those which we have seen. Okay. Notice that Kikongo has an awful lot of affixation. Kikongo is a language where you have noun class marking and it expresses itself in redundant concord. It's this kind of language, Kikongo. Any of you who are familiar with Swahili, you know the drill. This is card carrying Bantu. Now, Spanish is really the same thing. It's probably more familiar to most of us listening, but it's the same sort of thing with the redundant concord, lots of affixation. We don't call it noun class, we call it gender, but the two are really the same thing. These two versions of this silly little sentence, I'm gonna go back to the Kikongo, are really linguistically very similar. So what happens when Kikongo and Spanish come together? Well, with Paul and Caro, what happened was this. And what you see is it's the same sentence. These great white stones are those which we have seen. Okay, but look at how the Palenquero Creole sentence is quite different from Kikongo in Spanish because it's a language with very little affixation. It hasn't heard of Concord. So we have the difference between this and this and this. So Kikongo and Spanish come together and Creoles are just hybrids. But how is this Palenquero language, a hybrid of Spanish and Portuguese. Because remember, the idea is the extent of morphological complexity in terms of range of distinctions retained by a quote unquote contact language largely reflects the morphological structures of the target language and the particular languages that it came in contact with. That's, that's the idea here. But, you know, for a hybrid language, Palenquero is missing quite a lot of what its parents have. And so, for example, if Palenquero were just a hybrid and its morphological complexity were just based on what Spanish is and Kikongo are, then we would think Palenquero would have lots of noun phrase concord. It doesn't have any. That it would at least mark number obligatorily. That's what a Romance language does. Bantu languages happen to be that way too. Palenquero does not mark number obligatorily, just as Creoles tend not to. And there would be some sort of the type word, some sort of el type word, a definite determiner. And in Bantu, a rough equivalent to that is the augment marker. Kikongo has one. So if both parents had that, wouldn't you think that Palenquero would have it? But it doesn't. And then there are these two other things that both parents have, but 
Holland Caro doesn't. And as you can imagine, I could go on much longer with that list. So why isn't Holland Caro like Pupopia, for example? Talk about Brazil. There is a such thing as, say, an Iberian language, Portuguese, coming together with Kikongo, Kimbundu. And the result in Kupopia is that you have these Bantu words superimposed within a preserved Portuguese structure. So that's how that worked there. That is a hybrid language. That's the sort of thing that uniformitarians are talking about, and it certainly happens. But this is clearly very different from Palenquero, where you don't even have a difference between, for example, esta and other verbs to be. There's so much that is simply not there, either from Spanish or Kikongo. And the thing is that if this were just a Palenquero problem, well, you know, who cares about one exception? You know, science proceeds, and you have to allow that they're going to be hairs out of place. If Palenquero were just a fluke, then that would make Palenquero interesting, but we could move on and we could say that Creoles are just mixtures. But actually, the uniformitarian idea doesn't work with most Creoles. You could make the same kind of Palenquero case with the Creole Portuguese of Guinea Bissau. It's a mixture of West Atlantic and Portuguese, but it is nothing like what you would expect if it was just a hybrid. It really is much less needlessly complex than either a language like, like Wolof or Portuguese. Newbie Creole Arabic. Yes, folks, there are Arabic Creoles. It's a combination of Sudanese Arabic and some Nilo-Saharan languages. Nilo-Saharan languages are some of those languages that are often so complicated you can barely believe anybody speaks them. And Arabic, you know, has traits that challenge the second language learner. Those languages came together and created Nubi Creole Arabic, which is a Creole just like the others in terms of that streamlined kind of structure. Mauritian Creole French is similar. I'll just move on. So for example, Michel de Graff, who's one of the uniformitarians, has asked in print, what should be asked is whether a hypothetical Creole derived from contact among, say, Caucasian languages of the Tzez type. Caucasian meaning not spoken by white people, but languages of the Caucasus Mountains of the Tzez type, would end up looking like Saramaka. And these Caucasian languages of the Tzez type are extremely, extremely rich morphologically. Well, he asked that question. And we have explored this, and I just showed you the result. What happens when languages like that come together is Creoles like Palenquero, depending on the social conditions. So this suggests to some of us that Creoles are something. Something different happened. More happened than just mixture. Here's some sources, and you, know, you can look back on those. But basically, it comes down to this. If you read something, that claims that Creoles are just hybrids. And it doesn't refer to this Palenquero challenge that I just showed you, then it's an incomplete argument. It's inherently incomplete. If you're trying to figure out where you stand on where whether Creoles are a kind of language. If what you read doesn't address the Palenquero challenge, which frankly, I have to say this, it's been in print for almost 10 years, and this is not the first time I've presented it. If there's no reference to the Palenquero challenge, then you know, the argument is not wrong, but you haven't heard the full story. Also, anything that you hear about Creoles not coming from pigeons or not coming from severely interrupted transmission of language of some kind that doesn't refer to the Palenquero challenge, pretends it doesn't exist, if I may, that is an inherently incomplete argument if you're using it to decide whether Creoles are a kind of language or not. So for example, in nature, in 2017, there was this, in itself, neat article. Grammars are robustly transmitted even during the emergence of Creole languages. Now, what the point of this piece was, was to show that Creole's traits come from the parent languages and that pigeonization, a break in transmission has nothing to do with it. So in other words, the idea is that Creoles are just mixtures and have been misidentified as a kind of language. That's what a piece like this nature piece is actually saying. And I'm not saying that anybody was trying to cloak it, but I'm trying to give you a sense of what the parameters of the debate here are. Now, this piece, if you read it, and you should read it, it proves that Creoles are mixed languages beautifully. And there have actually been people who've argued that Creoles are mixed languages. So that's a whole other argument, but we'll just, you know, we'll let other people fight over that. This one very nicely shows that 
Creoles are mixed, but no one except a very few people these days denies that Creoles are mixed languages. That's an argument from 40 years ago. The question is how robust the transmission was from these parent languages, whether that was the whole story. So for example, here's another one of my schematics. Here's a red square, there's a blue square, there's their child, there's this, it, they, they, they had sex and they gave birth. One of them gave birth, Never mind. Point is, in the middle, you've got this purple thing. There's a red and there's a blue. Now you put red and blue together and they make purple. So clearly the child came from the red and the blue and they mixed together. But that's not the only difference between the middle square and the outer ones. The middle square, something different about the middle square and you can see what it is. Now, imagine somebody saying the purple square can't be smaller than the red or the blue squares because purple is one part red and one part blue. That is literally what the argument would be if someone says Creoles are mixed languages and therefore they can't come from pigeonization. The purple square can't be smaller than the red or the blue squares because purple is one part red and one part blue. And frankly, you know that doesn't make any sense. Now, you might even ask here, because if you care about Creoles at all, you've heard that you know, first you have a pigeon, then children learn it and it becomes a Creole. The bit about kids is kind of oversimplified, but it's a useful heuristic. And so you might think, do these uniformitarian scholars really think there's no evidence of Creoles coming from pigeons? Well, no, I mean, everybody knows that Tokpisan spoken out in to the east of Australia, that started as a pigeon. That's documented, it's on paper, nobody could deny it, they certainly wouldn't. And the story of Hawaiian Creole English developing from a pigeon, it's well documented. So the uniformitarians don't deny that. But their idea is that there are a certain handful of cases where a pigeon became a Creole, but that most of the Creoles spoken around the world just developed via mixture. But the thing is, they certainly look alike if we had these different processes of development. So here's Tokpisan. That's how you say, I was going. And you can see you've got these quote unquote particles to mark your tense and your aspect as opposed to affixation. And here's Shranam. So me ben ego, I was going. Past is one quote unquote particle and progressive is another quote unquote particle. And you can see that you have the oblique pronoun rather than the subject pronoun. It, it seems rather obvious that Tokpisan and Sranan are products of the same process. So there are mixed Englishes all over the world, but everybody understands that Tokpisan came from a pigeon. And you can tell because even in its now natively spoken form, it's this that you're looking at on the page right now. Sranang is very similar to Tokpisan in this and many other ways. And yet the uniformian, the uniformitarian idea is that Sranam formed via a different process where it was just language mixture. Tokpisan came from a pigeon. What's, what's the difference? Now, Mufwene has explained different evolutionary trajectories can nonetheless produce similar structural outcomes. Yes, <laughs> that's true, but is that something that we can argue here? Is there evidence that Sranan and Tokpisan developed in different ways? And at another point, he writes that structural similarities between expanded pigeons and creoles reflect the fact that they were developed largely by linguistic adults interacting regularly among themselves using materials from typologically related European and or substrate languages to meet diverse and complex communicative needs. Okay, okay. But isn't that really just saying that Tokpisan and Sranan developed in the same way? So for example, the diverse and complex communicational needs, how were they different in Suriname than they were in Oceania? And I have to say that Mufwane does not specify that. What, what were the differences? The economical way of looking at this scientifically might be to at least venture that Tokpisan and Sranan are products of the same process. If the result was the same, why should we suppose that the genesis process was different? What motivates us to make things untidy by proposing that. Now, a person might say, there is no documentation of a pigeon stage on plantations. 
So by the time we see Sranan on paper, it's already, it's a Creole, it's a real language as opposed to a pidgin, which is not. There's no documentation of on any plantation or in any plantation colony, something that's a pidgin, which later becomes a Creole. But the thing is on early plantations, very few people visited. Would you wanna to go to one? <laughs> Why would you go? Very few people visited and barely anybody wrote anything down. These were largely oral contexts. And so what that means is that there was no linguistic documentation of anything on the early plantations. You're lucky to get any scrap of anything that was going on when these places were founded. People were pulling tree stumps out of the ground. They were not writing grammatical descriptions of how slaves talked. So it won't do to say there's no evidence for the pigeons because there's no evidence of anything. You can deduce that plantation Creoles were born of the same process of Tokpisan because they differ from their source languages in the exact same way and were born amidst precisely similar socio-historical conditions. That's my two cents on that. Now, what do I mean by complexity? You know, tossing that out and you, know, you should, be, should be a little suspicious because that's a very, very complex concept. This is my phone. Anyway, what do I mean by complexity? Look at Portuguese here. So, he saw me swimming. Ele me viu nadando. No, I do not speak Portuguese. Here is São Tomense Creole Portuguese. That's spoken on one of the Gulf of Guinea Islands. And that's he saw me swimming. So, he, see, I, am, swim is the way it goes. Complexity. All right. So, there's Portuguese. There's Santamente Creole Portuguese. Now, is the difference between those two sentences because of different mixture of languages? Well, you might suppose, you can see the Portuguese sentence has a great deal of inflection. And if you're familiar with Portuguese or Spanish or a Romance language, you know how much more there is than anything I can show in this one sentence. Whereas Santamente is a highly analytic language. So that must mean that the mixture here involves some very analytic, you know, inflection shy languages that would create the difference. But the problem is, Santamense's parents are Portuguese, which is you know, very synthetic language, and then Edo, which is a Niger Congo language. And Edo is rather analytic, but only that. It's actually a language with inflectional processes, inflectional affixal processes. Then there's Kikongo. Kikongo, as we've seen, is every bit as synthetic as an Iberian language. So here's the Santamense Creole Portuguese, and it's analytic, and yet it was born of two extremely synthetic languages and one language that's about like English. Edo is not like, for those of you who are familiar with that part of the coast of Africa, Edo is not like Yoruba, Edo is not like Chui. Once you move over to the east, you start getting more stuff. So why is Santamense analytic the way it is? To be specific, you look at inflectional morphology, inflectional affixation, and all three of its source languages have it, two of them more than others, but still. Noun classes, if you talk about gender and noun classes being variations on the same thing, two of the languages, Portuguese and Kikongo had that. Phonemic and grammatical tone, that's something that Edo and Kikongo have. If Santamense is just mixture between Portuguese and Edo and Kikongo, wouldn't we expect it to have phonemic and grammatical tone. For those of you who are in the weeds with me sometimes, yes, Santa Benci has tone, but it parallels the stress. We're talking about phonemic and grammatical tone. Okay, I'm out of the weeds. Or heterogeneous word order. You've got object coming before the verb in various circumstances in Portuguese and also in Kikongo. This happens with the pronouns. That's not true in Edo, but two of the languages have that. So why doesn't Santa Benci, if we're talking about just mixture, kind of a strange mixture. Santamente is not, another word you'll hear used is convergence. Santamente is not only a convergence between Portuguese, Edo, and Kikongo. It's a convergence between some features from those languages mediated by the effects of adult acquisition of Portuguese. Santamente starts as a pigeon Portuguese. And so it begins in that way, and that determined which features were incorporated from the other languages in the context. It wasn't just that Portuguese, Edo, and Kikongo had drinks together and created something new that was one third each. Which 
features came in from Edo and Kikonko. There are all sorts of things in San Tomenti Portuguese that are certainly from Edo, for example. But then there are all sorts of things that aren't. And that's because all of this began as a pidgin language. Now, what's important is this. The uniformitarian position is that all languages are mixtures and that therefore all languages mix and have adult acquisition as being part of the process. So the idea is that mixture often involves this kind of abbreviation that adult acquisition can exert. So that's an interesting observation, but I'm not sure that it's supported by what specialists in language change have actually found. And so, for example, Enoch Abo and Michelle de Graff have said, it's our hunch that L2A, second language acquisition, plays a similar role in other instances of language change. Okay, but all right. Frankly, if I may, linguistic argumentation isn't about hunches. It's about data. You have to show it with information about languages all over the world changing over time. It can't just be a hunch. And more to the point, that hunch is resoundingly disproven by the whole literature on diachronic linguistics and even contact linguistics. Adult acquisition does not do the sorts of things in regular language change around the world that it does in creating something new like a Creole. That just simply isn't true. While we're on that kind of subject, I think I need to mention so that you can decide where you stand on whether Creoles are just mixtures of languages or not, is this. Michel de Graff in his work refers essentially only to Haitian Creole. And he does that because his assumption is that Haitian is representative of all Creoles. He's basically implying that if he can show that something is true or not true about Haitian, then we can assume that the same argument works with other Creoles. But what that neglects is that there are two kinds of Creole. And this is something which I did not make clear in my very first presentation on this sort of thing, which was now 700 years ago. But there are two kinds of Creoles, diglossic Creoles, and then ones that are isolated from their lexifier languages. All French Creoles are the diglossic kind as in they have always been spoken in the society where the lexifier language was still there and exists in a dynamic relationship with that language. That's true, for example, of Cape Vergian. Cape Vergian and Portuguese have a relationship. The English continuum Creole, say Jamaican Patois, Basilectal Jamaican Patois isn't spoken in isolation and never was. English itself has always also been spoken on Jamaica since colonization. But there are other Creoles where they have a different story for various reasons. So the Creoles of Suriname are spoken in a country where Dutch has ruled the day for a very long time, but they were based on English. So there is no continuum between Suriname, which is based on English, and Dutch. There's certainly bleed, especially after all this time, but still Suriname and Saramakan and Juca, they've developed on their own steam. The Gulf of Guinea Portuguese Creoles have not developed with Portuguese spoken over on the other side of the street. They are themselves, and as such, they are very different from Portuguese. You have to squint sometimes to see what the source would be of a lot of these languages. And it's also true of Tokpisan and its sisters. So when we're talking about Creole languages, there's some where what they were in the beginning, if they ever were, has been affected by the fact that they exist in a diglossic situation and always have. Haitian is one of those as opposed to, say, Saramakan, which is the Creole I know the most about, which has existed in isolation and tells the story more clearly. So de Graff can be rhetorically brilliant. And he has pages like this where he shows, for example, that Haitian has pretty much all of the derivational affixation that French has. This goes through and underlines each one. That's true of Haitian because Haitian has always existed alongside French. But the thing is, the demonstrations that de Graff shows that make it seem like if you don't get tripped up on French's highly prescriptive and antique spelling, you can see that Haitian is really just a romance language, essentially. The thing is, when he says those things, those things would not be demonstrable for, say, the Suriname Creoles or the Gulf of Guinea Creole Portugueses, or I'm calling Bislamic, Tokpisan and Bislama and Solomon Islands, Pigeon, et cetera. So for example, Suriname Creoles, 
probably didn't incorporate any English derivational morphology at all because they were born from pigeons. That's part of the whole argument. You couldn't make that demonstration that Michel de Graff makes with French derivation with the kinds of Creoles that I'm talking about. There are two kinds. So why am I going on and on about this? I'm near the end, but some of you are wondering, why is this so important? Well, you know why it's important? It's because if all languages are mixed, if Creoles are just language mixtures, then there's no reason to study them. The uniformitarians never put it this way, but they don't want Creole studies to exist, or at least it's hard to imagine that they do. Many modern Creolists are on a peculiar mission. They're determined to show that the languages they study aren't interesting. And why they're doing this is because people have said some really crappy things about Creoles for a very long time. Creole languages have very often been despised, thought of as not real languages, as unsuitable, etc. One way that you might try to defend Creole languages from that kind of treatment is to insist that there's nothing that distinguishes them from any other kind of language. But the problem is if you take this to a certain extent, what you're saying is that there's no reason to have a Creole conference. There shouldn't be books about Creole languages. It means that Creoles are not interesting as themselves, but goodness, ladies and gentlemen, they are. And what it comes down to is there've been times when adults learn a language quite incompletely and yet strange and often brutal socio-historical conditions mean that their rendition of that language is adopted as a people's main language. That has happened sometimes. That's a peculiar and in many ways regrettable circumstance, but it's not normal. It's an unusual thing. The new language that comes out of a situation like this has the complexity and nuance necessary to human speech. However, it has much less needless semantic overspecification, structural elaboration and irregularity than older languages because it's language reset. It's language starting again, having started again. Now, what do I mean by those metrics? That would be a different talk. Maybe I'll give that someday to Oberlin, but there's a book and it's a book that I wrote. It's called Language Interrupted. It has a nice cover. I always like that about Language Interrupted. That's a pretty book, but more to the point, in that book, I explain in detail what my complexity metric is. So I'm not just tossing those terms out. And believe me, they're not just about counting suffixes or something like that. But that's for another day. In any case, to deny that Creole languages were born from a stark interruption of language transmission is to deny the socio-historical tragedy that Creole's originators endured and the victory they achieved by creating language anew amidst those conditions. If you insist that Creole languages developed the way Finnish did, then you're denying what these originators went through. Uniformitarian Creolistics entails that under colonial slavery, language change and language contact were no different than they'd ever been or ever have been since. And if anybody tells you that I'm distorting their work, you will find when you consult it that I am not. And my question is, does anybody truly believe this? Does anybody truly believe that under those conditions, language transmission was uninterrupted and that this interruption and in transmission didn't have a decisive effect on the new language that emerged? Does anybody really believe that? I don't. I think magic happened. I think Creole languages are interesting. I really hope you do too. And obrigado, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor John. <laughs> so we are going to ask you some questions from the audience. Uh, we have this first one. Uh, let me see. Okay, I'll start from this one. If Creoles were languages like any other, should we need to have a branch of linguistics called Creolistics? Yes, because Creole languages are not 
languages like any other. They developed from unusual socio-historical circumstances that largely only started existing about 600 years ago when it was technologically possible to brutally transport large populations of people to another place and they would never see their home again and therefore had to learn a language very quickly and then use that rendition of the language as their everyday speech. That was unusual. That was barbaric in many ways, but the result was pigeons becoming real languages, which is what a Creole is. So they are different. And it's something where you wonder what would happen if people have 600 words, for example, Srana and Saramak are based on just 600 words of English, 600 words, very basic English grammar, and then they have a makeshift lingo. And so the makeshift lingo can only take the broad outlines of what even their native West African grammars were. But they speak this every day and the words come together and start creating new words. The grammar hits the ground running and starts developing into a real grammar. And pretty soon it's a grammar like any other with new rules as well as some rules from the source languages. That's neat. That is a really neat process. And yet, in modern Creole studies, it's considered vaguely naughty to describe the process that way. I won't have it. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, can a language pair be so different that their combination can never expand from a pidgin to Creole? Consider Chinese and Western European languages as an example. You mean, could it be that um, languages come together and they're just so different that you know everybody just <laughs> explodes? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. And I mean, I'm going on a hunch in this case that that's not the case. But you can also see things. There is, um, believe it or not, there's Chinese pidgin Russian. It's Russian as rendered by Chinese speakers, and it's a pidgin just like any other. And if the circumstances were different, you can see how it would develop into a Creole, or there are um, Native American languages that are very different from one another that came together in the Pacific Northwest in the United States and Canada. And they came together and they created something called Chinook jargon, which Creolized in some places. So any kind of languages can come together. And what you get is some sort of cross between the two. Generally, it's mostly words from one, but no, any languages can come together. And it's fascinating to see what the result is. You don't want to be too facile about this because usually the formation of a Creole is because of some kind of tragedy. It was, it was conditions that we would not wish to repeat. Nevertheless, from the strictly pointy-headed linguistic point of view, it's fascinating stuff. Now, I would like to pose my own question and then I'm going back to the audiences. Uh, I was looking at a survey from uh, Anderson at uh, Anderson Sayid and Vox about uh, complexification. Many examples of complexification allegedly violating some uh, some dichotomy uh, that Trugill had posed that languages in isolation are more prone to complexification than languages that stay in intense contact. Uh, among which there was Saramakan example of like the split accent tone. Uh, and I, I was wondering whether I can apply those laws and the way they behave on social factors onto my field of study, which is suprasegmental phonology, like the phonopragmatical sign, which is a signifier, which is chosen among a, a restricted bunch of combination of pitch accent and boundary tones and the pragmatic meanings. So you have many instances, for instance, of uh, re redundancy, overabund overabundance, okay? So many forms for the same function in the repertoire of a bilingual, of a bi-intonational speaker, or like an additive borrowing of these situations. You have additive borrowing at the beginning, uh, I, I suppose. So uh, are we in, the, in this kind of phonology, we, we also have instances of polysemy of the sign of like many, the same form, surface form for many post-lexical meanings. 
so I was wondering whether we can say, for instance, that adult learning implies tends to imply simplification, even with respect to the, the, the complexity of the non one to oneness of form and function between form and function, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can we call it a complex, a kind of complexity, many forms for one function? Um, yeah, you can. I mean, there are many different ways of thinking about what a metric of complexity would be, what complexity actually is. And so it's true, but I think what, what we're getting at here is that the complexity differential that we're talking about operates mostly upon morphology and syntax. It's been found that Creole languages are not especially unadorned in terms of phonology or supper segmentals. That sort of thing ends up being you know, recreated right away. Creole languages are never, to my knowledge, extremely complex phonologically, but they are also never extremely uncomplex phonologically. You would not be able to identify a Creole based on phonology alone. And so that's also true of supper segmentals. Nobody could say that supper segmentals and Creoles are somehow less complicated than they are in some ancient language. They're just, they're just the same. And so I think that's an important thing to know when I talk about complexity, I am not referring to phonology because it's been shown conclusively that that whole idea doesn't work in that module of grammar. Jeff Good had a wonderful paper about this. However, am I answering your question? Mm, well, negatively, but you are somehow. Uh, I was wondering um, about this because there are more many instances of possible redundancy of possibly like needless redundancy that could be eliminated by the language in the in some in some sense in a phonological layer and they actually are not in my examples okay mm -hmm. in my studies there is complexification going on right, uh, right. at the, the super segmental phonological level and so i, I was i would expect that yeah whether that is an indicator of non-adult adult learning of the first generation of mm -hmm. L1s, because mm -hmm. I cannot trace back in time my change situation. But anyways, yeah. I am going back to the audience because <laughs> I took That's too much very time. Good and OK, uh, how can we conciliate the subtract influence with the global similarity of Creole languages with different substructs? Mm -hmm. Substrate influence is important in almost every Creole. It's quite clear that the creators transferred structures from their languages into the Creole. However, there are ways that Creoles tend to be similar, such as being very low on inflectional affixation and inflectional morphology in general, you know, whether it's bound or not in, for example, having almost no contextual <coughs> pardon me, having no contextual inflection at all, as opposed to inherent inflection. And in terms of tense and aspect and often mood being indicated by clitics slash particles that tend to be of a certain type, there are many that you would expect, certain ones tend to occur again and again and combine in rather interestingly similar ways. Derek Bickerton is looking down on me and you know, patting me on the back for finally saying that he was right about something. There are certain things about Creoles that are too similar for it to be an accident. And the reason that they're similar is that there are certain things that happen when language starts again. And so the specifics of Derek Pickerton's Roots of Language proposal, of course, all of that has to be changed after 40 years. And I don't think anybody thinks that Creole languages are a closer reflection of universal grammar than older languages, especially since it's becoming rather clear that universal grammar under that conception probably doesn't exist. Nevertheless, there's a reason that the Chinook jargon Creole was very similar in structure to Tokpisan and to Sranon. All of these are what happens when language starts again. Next question. Apart from the Creole genesis question, which aspects 
at CREOS would you like to see studied? I find the analysis of the dynamics of the transatlantic encounters fascinating in themselves. You know what needs to be studied more in Creoles is pragmatics. And I'm not saying that just because it's kind of cool to talk about pragmatics these days because it's sort of the other grammar, but pragmatics is the other grammar. I mean, pragmatics is an awful lot of what allows communication and it's systematic, it's complicated. And with most Creoles, we don't know that much about, for example, how the sentence final particles are used. Like of late now, we know what they're like. We, I'd say, as if I've studied Santamente Creole Portuguese, they know what they're like in Santamente Creole Portuguese. But there's a lot more to pragmatics than that. And I know from my study of Saramakan that an awful lot that you want to think of as quote unquote grammar is really pragmatics expressed in various ways that they that, that it was not in, for example, its source languages, it's things that people created in the rainforest of Suriname. And it can be part of what makes a language interesting as just a language. But it would be interesting if there were anything that Creoles had in common in terms of how they handle their pragmatics. And I don't know if Creole pragmatics are somehow more streamlined than pragmatics in other languages. I would guess that they wouldn't be. I would guess it would be just like phonology. But it'd be interesting to see. Is there such thing as Creole pragmatics? I don't think anybody has ever paid much attention to that. I, I'd like to see that study. Thank you, I agree. Pragmatics uh, are pragmatics, fun. About <laughs> the, the need of studying pragmatics, and phonopragmatics. It's the new linguistics. So one more question about the, the, the Creoles in Saint Tomé in Principe. I wonder why you classify them as not being in contact with the lexifier since Portuguese is very widely spoken in São Tomé e Príncipe. Oh, yes, of course. But when those Creoles were forming, they were used by people who had very little contact with Portuguese. And that was the situation for them for a long time. The modern situation, of course, there's Portuguese is there. That's the language of the wider world. But it didn't form within that kind of deglossia. The language is formed and existed for a very long time in isolation from that language, as I once heard a speaker calling it. So we may say the, the, the standard Portuguese, which, which is being taught now, is like it's sort of a revital, revitalization from scratch of exactly. standard language. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, doesn't uniformist theorists' position make Creole language interesting in the sense that they become laboratories to study the birth and death of languages? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure that I would say that in that the, to the uniformitarian's point of view, there's nothing interesting about the emergent of Creole. So it isn't the birth of language, it's just language is mixed and the result was the same kind of mixture that created Norwegian from the mixture of you know, low German and old Norse. Bad example though, because there was a simplification that happened there. But you look at the languages of Australia and the Amazon and you think of the Gaulish influence that created French out of Latin. To the uniformitarian, Creoles are just that. So they can't tell you anything about the birth of language that Polish couldn't. And to me, that seemed not an accurate view of how these languages seemed to have formed. Now, as far as language death, that is unfortunately something going on with a lot of Creole languages. But then again, I'm not sure whether the way it happens with Creole languages is different from the way it happens around the world. So, you know, on one end, I'd say no, and on the other end, I'd say yes. We have two more questions so far. Okay. If you can take it. I can. Uh, what do uniformitarians mean when they say that L2 acquisition also changes non-Creole languages? Are they talking about, for example, dialects of Spanish all over Latin America? Latin America? Mm -hmm. Or something mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the question, but I think it's important to realize that for a uniformitarian, we're really talking about a radical proposal. They're saying that second language acquisition doesn't have anything to teach us about how you get, for example, Santa Menci Creole Portuguese from Portuguese, because second language acquisition, remember the hunch that Abo and de Graaf talk about, second language acquisition is happening in the birth of languages all around the world. So presumably, and I'm sure second language acquisition played some role in the birth of Japanese. I'm sure second language acquisition played some role in the birth of Vietnamese. The idea is that we're making a racist mistake to see Creoles as anything different from Japanese or Vietnamese. I'm not, I'm not caricaturing their, their view. This is really what they're arguing. It's a radical proposal. But that means that second language acquisition is something different from Creole genesis, because Creole genesis was the same thing as how Icelandic was born. It's an, it's an interesting way of looking at things, but I'm not sure that the evidence supports it. OK, thank you. So we have this last one. Uh, does the Creole prototype proves that non-inflectional morphology is easier for adult learners than inflectional morphology? Yes, it does. And so Creole prototype is a, it's a theory of mine that you can tell that a language is a Creole based on three things that it doesn't have. One of them is what we can basically call um, ablo, ablas, abla, or sombrero versus luna, so inflection morphology. One of them is lexical and grammatical tone. And the other one is kind of boring and difficult to get across, but it is opaque derivation. So in English, if I say understand, but you're not standing under anything. If a language has little or none of all three of those things, it was born as a pigeon probably a few hundred years ago. But yes, the reason for that is that inflectional morphology is challenging for non-native learners. It tends to be not only very Baroque, but often it has irregularities. You have to learn the morphophonemics. So yes, those things are challenging to adult learners. And so it's not surprising that when someone creates a vision, inflectional morphology is one of the first things to go in anything but shards. And then when the new language is born, it doesn't immediately sprout inflectional morphology because inflectional morphology takes a while to grammaticalize. A diglossic Creole will take some from that lexifier language that it's spoken alongside. But the isolated kind of Creole, even hundreds of years later, won't have any identifiable inflectional affixation, for example, or all but none. And that's because it was created by grown-ups who let the inflectional morphology go in the language that they were exposed to because it made acquisition difficult. OK. So I not see any more questions on my list. So we would like to thank again. I will ask you to, to make a final word. But yeah. first, I, I want to, on behalf of the Aberlin, uh, thank you very much for your talk and for your presence here tonight. And I would like to remind the uh, associate, the, 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 all the, the, speak, the, the, the audience, the person who are watching us, the importance of becoming members in the Aberlin in order to both uh, strengthen the, 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 the area of linguistic in Brazil in general and the engagement of the community in this project, which is a gigantic one and uh, is like bringing us all together, uh, discussing the, the, the most various uh, aspects of uh, this uh, wonderful field we are in. So, uh, Professor McWhorter, do you want to make some, a uh, couple of final words to end the, the speech? Sure. Um, I want to also make it clear that this is a continuum process and that second language acquisition played a major role in the birth of the language that I'm speaking right now. So that according to the way I look at these things, the normal language is Icelandic. That's what Germanic, quote unquote, should be like. That is Proto-Germanic, evolving, uninterrupted, Icelandic. 
English is interrupted somewhat. English is a semi-Creole language. The Viking invasions made this a very different Germanic language from Icelandic. And then something like Sranan or Tokpisan, those are Creoles. Those are where that interruption was the starkest so that things went to the pidgin level and then the pidgin was reborn as a new language. So these things are clinal. Languages fall at different points along the cline and Creoles are just the fascinating extreme. But languages differ worldwide in the extent to which adults ineptitude at learning languages created the need for new solutions. Thank you very much again. My pleasure. Uh, have a good night to everybody. <laughs> I'll try. And stay Creole. <laughs>